We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Ancient DNA analyses began almost 40 years ago with the technological advances associated with PCR and were immediately applied to questions about human population history. Um, one of the pioneers of ancient DNA research was Savante Pabo, who just won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, quote, for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution, unquote. In 1997, Svante Pabo led the first ancient DNA study of a Neanderthal to try to assess the relationship between Neanderthals and modern humans. And in this study, which I was part of, we used ancient DNA methods to retrieve a portion of uh, mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA genome, um, which is only inherited from your mother, um, it really kind of surprisingly, I guess, um, suggested that Neanderthals and modern humans were not related to each other uh, in terms of interbreeding. Um, and this was a major debate at the time. However, as I said, the mitochondrial DNA genome is, it's really a very small portion of our genome. And it's unlike the rest of our genome in that we inherit it only from our mothers. Uh, in 2010, the first study of the full Neanderthal genome was published, also from Svante's lab. And this, along with subsequent genome sequences from additional Neanderthals, as well as another archaic human known as a Denosovan, showed us that there was, in fact, interbreeding among archaic and modern humans. And here you can see that with the blue arrows. Uh, in the diagram, and each of these shows at least one admixture event. Um, so when you look at this, what you can see is that there were multiple cases of admixture at different points in time uh, among different hominins. And we see evidence of admixture between early anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals even prior to the major expansion of anatomically modern humans out of Africa 50 to 70,000 years ago. And this is likely something that happened during um, climatic periods when the Sahara was greener. Um, and that facilitated uh, expansion, sort of little movements out of Africa and interactions between kind of separated groups. Um, those were likely in the Middle East. We see evidence of that archeologically. Um, and the genome data now support that that uh, gene flow occurred. In addition, we see insights into the timing and um, number of admixture events. Um, we also see from the genome data, which, which includes some really high quality genomes, what kind of variation there was in the population, what kind of genetic variation, and what kind of adaptations. We can make inferences about those as well. And from the variation, or actually rather the, the, the limited amount of variation found in archaic humans, 
we can infer that they had fairly small populations. Um, and we also see evidence of inbreeding. We can also compare the genomes of modern humans today to see how much DNA we inherited from archaic humans. And what we see is that non-Africans have about one to 5% archaic human ancestry, that is from Neanderthals or Denisovans. And the distribution of this ancestry is not even. So it's not even geographically when we look at populations from different places. Uh, for example, people in Southeast Asia, uh, island Southeast Asia in particular, and Australia uh, and the Philippines have more Denisovan ancestry. It's also not even across our genome, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Some of the archaic alleles that we have in modern humans appear to be adaptive, uh, and examples have included alleles uh, related to immunity, skin pigmentation, and high altitude adaptation. Now, evolution, which is the change in allele frequencies from generation to generation, hasn't stopped. Ancient DNA analyses have also shown us that the forces of evolution, including selection, gene flow or migration, and genetic drift, have been important during the Holocene as well, particularly related to the major shift in subsistence from hunting and gathering to agriculture. So what questions remain and how will additional ancient DNA data build on the initial findings related to human evolution? Um, first, we can think about this in terms of sort of who, when, where sorts of questions. Um, were there additional admixture events with other groups of archaic humans? If so, where and when? Um, we have limited data from Australia, Southeast Asia, um, and Africa in particular. And for example, we know as I mentioned, that people in island Southeast Asia and Australia have more Denisovan ancestry. And you can see that here on the map, but we don't actually have Denisovan DNA uh, from that region, from, from actual um, bones. And uh, so, you know, what we do know from looking at modern human DNA with Denisovan uh, admixture is that there's likely a different source population in terms of um, the Denisovan population that contributed to that ancestry. So it's likely a different source population compared with the individuals who lived at Denisova Cave um, or that contributed Denisovan ancestry to the people who live in, in mainland Asia today. Um, we can also use sedimentary DNA analyses and analyses of ancient proteins in places where there are no bones or there are only tiny, tiny bone fragments. And this can be particularly useful in places where we have a very complex stratigraphy. So for example, at Denisova Cave, which is where we get the, the term Denisovan, um, you can see this very complex stratigraphy and in these different occupation letter, layers, um, using these sedimentary DNA and uh, mass spectroscopy um, protein analyses, we can infer whether Denosovan or Neanderthals or even both um, were living in the cave at that time. Uh, so that's a, a really exciting um, feature to be used at sites like Denisova Cave and, and elsewhere. Um, and in addition, ancient proteins actually preserve better than ancient DNA. And so these data can help push back uh, identifications back in time and place. We can also use both the sedimentary DNA and the ancient proteins to identify what animals these individuals were hunting and as I said, in terms of identifying who occupied uh, the cave at certain time periods, we can see what stone tools were they using and then link potentially Denisovans to other sites um, where we don't have DNA or protein preservation and get a better sense of their distribution, both in time and space. 
Um, so I think ideally these methods will be um, used in combination with other archaeological analyses and really let us put together a picture of a site. For example, the use areas, if people butchered in one area and maybe slept in a different area, um, help us identify both plant and animal resources that, that they used and even show us the biological relationships among individuals within a group so that we can make inferences about social organization. So in terms of what questions remain and how additional ancient DNA data can build upon this, we can also think about the legacy of archaic admixture in modern humans today. Um, so a number of, of really fascinating questions uh, remain, one of which is, why do we have so little Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry uh, today? Now, part of the reason is that anatomical, anatomically modern humans, in a sense, swamped out the smaller populations of archaic humans over time. But there's also evidence that some of this archaic DNA may have been deleterious or slightly deleterious. And um, analyses of an additional individuals who lived soon after admixture events, uh, as well as computer modeling, can give us a better sense of how quickly archaic DNA was lost. Uh, in other words, sort of a sense of the cost, uh, if there was one, of archaic DNA in our own genomes. Um, and we can look at the so-called ancient DNA uh, or archaic DNA deserts in our genomes. So this map here shows a distribution of Neanderthal ancestry. Um, and this is taken from hundreds of genomes of Europeans and East Asians. Uh, East Asian genomes, the, the regions that are Neanderthal or have been found in, in East Asian genomes to have Neanderthal alleles uh, are in red. Uh, and in blue are those that um, have been discovered in European genomes. And one of the things we see is several places where in neither group is there any Neanderthal ancestry, so these white areas. And so these are so-called archaic or Neanderthal deserts uh, in terms of the DNA in our genome. Um, and so we might ask why, is that by chance? Um, or is there something there that is important for being a modern human? And if so, what is it? What does it do? And how does it contribute to our phenotypes today? So functional analyses may help us figure out what these differences are between modern human and archaic human gene variants uh, in these regions. We can also think, you know, what have we um, gained in terms of alleles from archaic humans? What is the adaptive legacy? Um, Neanderthals and Denisovans lived in Eurasia far longer than, than we have, and thus likely adapted to the environment. Um, we've identified some variants that affect specific genotypes uh, or, or specific phenotypes, but these are what we know is very largely biased by the phenotype data that we have which is mostly medical in nature, in terms of having a, a real sense of the distribution linked to clear genetic genomic variants. Um, we also have a poor sense of more complex phenotypes, which are really most of the phenotypes we tend to think about. Um, and the phenotype genotype data that we do have is primarily from European populations. Um, we don't really have comparative data yet uh, for Denosovan variants, which are mostly found in people from, as I said, island Southeast Asia uh, in particular. So much of the variation that we do have is likely to be regulatory in nature or affect regulatory regions of our genome. Um, and there are ways to infer gene regulation, specifically because methylation changes, or we can infer methylation patterns, which turn kind of help turn genes on and off based on damage patterns that we see in the ancient DNA. And so this was done in a study by Gockman et al. Um, to look at what regulatory regions were methylated particularly differently between archaic humans and modern humans. And 
Um, really interestingly, one of the regions that um, was found to be very different was associated with the face and vocal tract um, in anatomically modern humans compared with archaic humans. And so this is an area where the further work to tease out these signatures and what they mean will be very interesting. So I think we can look forward to many exciting insights into anthropogeny from ancient DNA research. Um, and while I have focused on the questions related to archaic humans, um, there's also many interesting projects using ancient DNA to understand human population history in uh, the Holocene, as well as the process of domestication um, and the evolution of human pathogens. And so I think we will um, have a lot of really fascinating findings in the future. Um, I would like to thank not just the organizers of this symposium, but also the members of my laboratory and the funding agencies who have funded our research in the past. Thank you very much.